David is five years old. He has developmental delay. He can speak a few words, and his cochlear implants that he got recently have helped him to gain some more. David has an abnormal neuro exam at baseline, and he needs total care. Today, his mother brings him in for a fever and a runny nose. He's going to be just fine. He'll go home with supportive care. As with any child with special needs or a chronic condition, I like to get a sense of what else could be going on. Who is this person who has the condition, not just what condition the person has? I start with a simple, how are things at home? That was all that mom needed to open up. David was not always this way. His mother came to this country just before David was born. She was healthy and she had good prenatal care. David was also born a healthy, full-term boy. Mother and child went home just over 24 hours after birth. The family was ecstatic, if not a little tired. They were told to check in with their pediatrician in the next two weeks. Only, mom didn't have a pediatrician for David. She didn't speak the language, and the whole experience was overwhelming. She didn't think any further than this wonderful moment with her newborn son. Two days later, when David was three days old, mom brings him into a local emergency department because her mother thought David looked like a little lemon. David was triaged as low acuity. They waited for about two hours. David bundled up, mom pacing. The family felt they weren't given the attention they needed, so they left. They tried another ED a few hours later. David was then 83 hours old. On that presentation, his vitals were normal, but he appeared slightly irritable. He was orange now. His total serum bilirubin was 44.1 milligrams per deciliter, four times normal. IV access established, David was volume repleted. Just before his admission, his repeat examination showed decreased tone in his left leg. Also, he tended to turn his head and trunk to the right, but his lower extremities stayed midline. He went upstairs soon after for an exchange transfusion. Welcome to the playbook. I'm your host and coach, Tim Horechko. David's is a cautionary tale. Now, most newborns will have some jaundice. Most jaundice is benign. So, how can we sort through the various presentations and keep our newborn safe? We can make many analogies in emergency medicine. The two most common complaints we see in adults are chest pain and abdominal pain. The majority of cases end up benign, but that's not how we approach them. Jaundice, too, can end up just fine until it doesn't. To make things harder, there's a lot of folklore and anecdotes among patients as well as clinicians. Today, we'll talk about this common problem with potentially devastating consequences and what we can do to solve it. When a baby is born with jaundice, it's always bad. This is pathologic jaundice, and it's almost always caught before the baby goes home. This is your ABO incompatibility, your G6PD deficiency, Krehler Najjar, metabolic disturbances, and infections, just to name a few. Newborns are screened and managed. Physiologic jaundice, on the other hand, is usually fine until it's not. All babies have some inclination to develop jaundice. Their livers are immature. They may get a little dehydrated, especially if mother's milk is late to come in. 
in the olden days, babies who looked a little yellow would be brought out into the gentle sunlight. No serum levels were checked, and for the most part, we all turned out okay. Unless we didn't. In today's practice, we are challenged to catch those at risk for developing complications from just too much bilirubin floating around in the blood. Hyperbilirubinemia is the result of at least one of three processes. You make too much, you don't process it enough, or you don't get rid of it fast enough. We need to have a little bit of bilirubin around for our bile acids to aid us in digestion. We just have to deal with a little extra as a side effect of normal red blood cell aging and recycling. Also, we have to be able to get rid of whatever excess there is. So we can go wrong by too much production, not enough conjugation, or not enough excretion. First, increased production. Bilirubin mostly comes from the recycling of red blood cells. Heme is broken down in the liver and spleen to biliverdin, then bilirubin. Normal full-term babies without jaundice run a little high. Bilirubin production is two to three times higher than in adults because they're born with a higher hematocrit. Also, fetal hemoglobin is great at holding on to oxygen, but with that oxyhemoglobin superpower comes an inherent weakness, a shorter lifespan. So, at baseline, newborns have a lot going on. The increased red blood cell turnover naturally produces more bilirubin. There's also some variability by racial background. Black babies and white babies will have a serum bilirubin peak at two to four days of age. Babies of East Asian ancestry tend to have slightly higher serum bilirubin levels and will peak a little later at days three to five. These children will also tend to resolve their hyperbilirubinemia on average a few days later than other newborns. Next, impaired conjugation. Think of bilirubin as your email. Unconjugated bilirubin is your unread email. To process it or get rid of it, you have to open it. It's very hard to get rid of most of your unread email without checking it out first, without processing it. And of course, the more unread messages that accumulate, the more unwell you feel. Conjugated bilirubin is your opened and processed email. So much easier to sort out, deal with, and get rid of. Lastly, decreased excretion. Both unread email and unconjugated bilirubin are hard to get rid of. It just continues to float around in your inbox, or in the case of unconjugated bilirubin, it keeps getting reabsorbed in the intestinal mucosa through enterohepatic circulation. Unconjugated bilirubin just doesn't go away. Processed email and conjugated bilirubin is easier to sort out. Conjugated bilirubin is water-soluble, so it goes right into the red folder in your gallbladder and is excreted off your inbox. Later on down the line in the intestine, conjugated bilirubin can't be reabsorbed through your intestinal mucosa. Kind of like when you open an email and forget about it, it passes on through your system. Newborns are terrible at answering emails. They'll get the hang of it soon enough. For now, a lot of unread, unconjugated bilirubin is floating around. The liver and spleen are just not able to keep up. Also, newborns have a double whammy administrative load. Normally, bacteria in the gut can further break down conjugated bilirubin to urobilin and get excreted in the urine. No help here. The infant's gut is relatively sterile, so no admin assistance there. Just to add to the workload that a poor little newborn has to do, he's being sabotaged by extra beta-glucuronidase, which will take his hard-earned conjugated bilirubin and unconjugate it again, then recycle it, just like email you marked as unread. A lot going on. 
Remember, babies are terrible at email. It's a Sunday morning, and mom and dad bring in four-day-old Amber to the ED for a checkup. Amber was born full-term, healthy, with no complications on Thursday morning. They went home Saturday, and they have an appointment tomorrow to see their pediatrician. They were concerned about Amber's face. It looks a little yellow to them. Following the good precautionary advice they were given, mom and dad come in just to be checked out. Now, these presentations can be a little frustrating, let's be honest. There may or may not be a cause for concern. You don't want to expose this newborn to the ED any longer than you have to. And of course, there's always the question of iatrogenia, just because the child ended up at the wrong place at the wrong time. Unfortunately, what you do know about little Amber is limited. She was born at another hospital, and you don't have access to her routine bilirubin check at birth to have some idea of where she's headed. So, you start from the basics. We have to know the date and hour of the day that the child was born. This may seem silly at first, but the nomogram we'll use changes hourly. Also, is the baby breastfed? bottle fed, or both. Ask about hydration status, like the number of wet diapers per day. Normal is 5 to 6 per 24-hour period. Ask about any other known risk factors for hyperbilirubinemia. Jaundice in the first 24 hours, prematurity, siblings who needed phototherapy, or East Asian ancestry. Do a good physical exam and look for signs of dehydration, like lethargy, no tears, dry mucous membranes, or sunken eyes, or sunken fontanelle. Check for a cephalohematoma from the birthing process. That may be a source of recycled RBCs, and so more unconjugated bilirubin is floating around. If mom and dad happen to know about ABO incompatibility or known hemolytic disease like G6PD deficiency, it's helpful to know. Do the best you can with what you can find out. On exam, Amber appears well, no cephalohematoma. She has the normal flexed baseline of a healthy newborn. Amber does look a little yellow in the cheeks, but maybe it's the light or maybe you were just primed to see something. Really, she looks great. So what do we do now? I look at it this way. If we knew the previous bilirubin at birth, if we had the chart at birth, if we felt more assured that the parents could carry out the plan, and given we have a normal exam and good follow-up, we may elect to go back to the original plan, which is to be seen tomorrow and forego emergent testing. Let's be honest, though. It just never works out that way. Whether or not there's something to substantiate the parents' concerns, let's err on the side of caution. Okay, what's the next step? You could argue that this child would be a fair candidate for a transcutaneous measurement of her bilirubin level. That seems reasonable, with one caveat. Know your institution's policy and experience with your particular transcutaneous bilimeter. There's a lot of variability between manufacturers and even within an institution. Many have to be calibrated. You can use the forehead or the sternum. Like a pulse oximeter, light is directed into the subcutaneous tissues and the machine registers the wavelength of light returned to the sensor. The signal runs through the microprocessor and it estimates a bilirubin. How reliable are they? The conventional understanding is that the serum and transcutaneous bilirubin levels correlate reasonably well. Taylor et al. published a study in pediatrics called Discrepancies Between Transcutaneous and Serum Bilirubin Measurements. They had data on 925 subjects with simultaneous serum and transcutaneous bilirubin levels in newborns. The mean difference was less than 1 mg per deciliter, with an interquartile range of about 2 mg per deciliter. So that sounds great, right? Well, even in this well-done study, 
2.2% of paired measurements showed that the transcutaneous bilirubin measurement underestimated the serum measurement by 3 mg per deciliter or more. This is a substantial difference that would change disposition. After all, the bilimeter measures the bilirubin in extravascular tissues and is not a definitive substitute for serum measurement. Having said that, transcutaneous measurements can tell us when to be more concerned and may push us to get the blood test. Mom, Dad, and Amber are already here. In fact, if this were a weekday, now would be the time to recheck anyway. There's also some uncertainty about whether there was any concern at birth. So, we do a transcutaneous. The machine's not working. We draw blood. Now, if you're getting blood, you'll want total and fractionated bilirubin. So, just get liver function tests so that you can also have an albumin. You'll see why this comes in handy later. Also, if you're getting blood, you'll want a CBC for the hematocrit. That's the bare bones you need for the routine screen. If there's any concern for pathologic jaundice, add a blood type, an RH factor, Coombs test, and a reticulocyte count. At that point, if I'm doing anything other than routine screening, I add a chemistry panel. One take-home point here. A lurking specter in the haunted house of hyperbilirubinemia is sepsis. Always consider a septic workup, even for the afebrile neonate with jaundice. Amber today is really doing great. We're not even sure she has hyperbilirubinemia. Really, she was just routed to the wrong venue, but we'll do our due diligence. It turns out Amber's serum total bilirubin is 15.3 milligrams per deciliter. In an adult, this would be alarming. But is it for Amber? Well, we know that she's low risk because she's term and she has no other risk factors. But there is one crucial piece of information that we need in order to risk stratify her. When was she born? It's not enough to know simply how many days old she is, but how many hours old. If you just looked at the nomogram and punched in 96 hours since the child is four days old by report, then 15.3 milligrams per deciliter at 96 hours without risk factors puts the child at high intermediate risk. We have to know the hour of her birth. Luckily, most parents can tell you when their child came into the world. Amber was born at 3 a.m. on Friday morning. Glad we asked. That means at the time of collection, she was 103 hours old. 15.3 milligrams per deciliter of total bilirubin at 103 hours of age actually puts her at low intermediate risk. No further action is needed other than to keep the child hydrated. Let's talk, step by step, how to use the nomogram. The Bhutani nomogram was published in 2004 in Pediatrics. It's a series of three curves that we follow by the child's age in hours. Each curve corresponds to a risk group. Low, intermediate, and high. This lets us know whether or not the child is in the acceptable range of bilirubin. This is what we all used before the Billy tool came out, an online calculator that I really recommend. It makes the calculation and interpretation so much easier. Toggle down to the date and day of birth. Enter the time the specimen was collected. Now enter the serum bilirubin. I've been using US units here, but you can enter SI units as well. The calculator will give you two things. One, the neonate's risk for developing hyperbilirubinemia and therefore what follow-up is recommended, and two, the neonate's risk for neurotoxicity and whether phototherapy should be initiated. First, let's talk about risk for hyperbilirubinemia and DISPO. 
After you enter when the child was born and his bilirubin at what hour of life, the calculator will give you a risk for developing severe hyperbilirubinemia. Low, low intermediate, high intermediate, or high risk. The idea is that although the child may be doing all right at this moment, charting his bilirubin based on hour of life can predict his risk of flattening out or increasing his levels. You can then match his risk for developing hyperbilirubinemia with the appropriate disposition, follow-up, and time frame. For example, if Amber were low risk soon after birth, she's put in the default pathway for a recheck in 48 hours. Amber is at low intermediate risk for developing severe hyperbilirubinemia. Knowing that, we check to see her risk for going on to develop neurotoxicity. Some features put the child with hyperbilirubinemia at risk for developing subsequent neurotoxicity. These are some of the same for developing severe hyperbilirubinemia with a few additions. Lethargy, temperature instability, acidosis. These children you would definitely investigate for sepsis, which happens to be another risk factor for neurotoxicity in the setting of hyperbilirubinemia. After assessing for risk factors for neurotoxicity, check to see if the patient meets the threshold for phototherapy at his current bilirubin level. Follow the table to match up his risk factors and find out what would be the threshold for him to start phototherapy. You see, conjugated bilirubin, the good kind of bilirubin, is water-soluble and easy to get rid of. Unconjugated bilirubin, the kind that we're worried about, is fat soluble. It can permeate neurons and cause neuronal damage. In Amber's case, she is 103 hours old, full term, and has no risk factors. She's still low intermediate risk for developing significant hyperbilirubinemia. Her bilirubin is 15.3 milligrams per deciliter. Given her lack of risk factors, at her age, her bilirubin would have to be at a threshold of 20.3 to consider phototherapy, so she's okay for now. Well, it works both ways. At her current age and her current bilirubin, if she had the additional risk factor of, say, prematurity, the calculator would tell you that her threshold for phototherapy would drop to 17.8. That's starting to get a little bit close for little Amber. If we made her albumin low, let's say less than three grams per deciliter, and we made her premature, then the threshold for phototherapy would drop even further to 14.8. At Amber's current 15.3 and all of the risk factors we added for neurotoxicity, Amber would actually need phototherapy. This is why we need to assess for risk for severe hyperbilirubinemia and risk for neurotoxicity, given a certain hour of life and a certain current bilirubin. Lots of moving parts. You can use the manual nomogram or make your life easier and use the validated online calculator, Billy Tool. Luckily, Amber is full term, well, has low intermediate risk for developing severe hyperbilirubinemia, and she has no risk factors for developing neurotoxicity. She can be followed as per routine. Aren't you glad you checked? Sunny is a four-day-old baby girl born full term with no complications. Mother and baby went home on day of life too. Luckily, Sunny's records are available to you. She was discharged 4% down from her birth weight, and mom was breastfeeding but needed some extra support. Mom is of Asian ancestry, 23 years old, and RH positive. She's healthy and has lots of family support. Today was their scheduled office visit, but after the pediatrician's nurse saw that Sunny was markedly jaundiced and a bit fussier than she should be, the family was sent to the ED for further testing. Talking with the family, it looks like Sunny has only had two wet diapers in the past 24 hours. She is definitely fussy, if not irritable. 
her extended family told mom not to worry about jaundice because it's so common and they had mom give Sunny free water a few times because they saw that Sunny was getting dehydrated. On exam, Sunny is moderately dehydrated. She is afebrile, heart rate is 164, respiratory rate 50, blood pressure 65 over 40. She was born at 3.1 kilograms. Today, she's 2.7 kilograms. So that's 13% down from her birth weight in just four days. No cephalohematoma. She has a slightly sunken fontanelle, but with normal tone and activity. She is very fussy, if not possibly irritable. Her sclera are slightly icteric. Usually babies don't show scleral icterus until severely jaundiced. It's an insensitive sign in contrast to what we see in adults. Babies usually start to show yellow discoloration of the skin from the head, then trunk and extremities. Sometimes the gums will show signs of jaundice early on. So, Sunny is sick. You volume replete her and investigate and empirically treat for sepsis. It's probably all hyperbilirubinemia and dehydration, but we just can't take that risk. You calculate her hour of birth, 121 hours, which is actually five days old, not four days as the sleep-deprived parents told you. Sunny's total bilirubin is 20 milligrams per deciliter at 121 hours, putting her at high risk for severe hyperbilirubinemia. She needs fluids and admission for phototherapy. Why phototherapy? To decrease the risk of neurotoxicity. The next day, with good hydration and phototherapy, lactation consultation, and more support, Sunny's bilirubin decreases to 12 milligrams per deciliter, and she goes home with good follow-up. Any child you admit for phototherapy should be assessed for the need for exchange transfusion. Phototherapy really only takes the edge off. It mops up the excess in a well child who just needs a bit of a boost in conjugation and excretion while his healthy body gets rid of the rest. If you're admitting for phototherapy, always ask yourself, does this baby actually need something more aggressive like exchange transfusion. This time you'll use a different nomogram. It looks very similar to the Bhutani phototherapy nomogram. Just think of all three curves bumped up 5 to 10 milligrams per deciliter. There's a table of the exchange transfusion nomogram in the original article and a link to it on the online calculator builder tool. Having said that, numbers don't replace clinical judgment. Any child with hyperbilirubinemia and any of the following signs should get immediate exchange transfusion. Hypertonia, arching, opisthotonus, fever or high-pitched cry. This is acute bilirubin encephalopathy. Okay, so we've risk stratified the neonate. Maybe he can go home with close follow-up, or maybe he needs admission, or maybe he needs critical care maneuvers. How do we manage the various levels of escalated care? Home care. The neonate who is safe to go home is well-appearing, and he's not dehydrated. His total bilirubin is in the low to low intermediate risk for developing severe hyperbilirubinemia, and he's not at high risk for neurotoxicity based on risk factors. Babies need to stay hydrated. Breastfeeding mothers need encouragement and need to offer feeds 8 to 12 times per day, an exhausting regimen. The main message is stick with it. Make sure the family knows what they can do to help mom stay hydrated, to eat well, and to try to rest whenever she can. 
Supplementing with formula or expressed breast milk is not routinely needed. Just be explicit that the neonate should not receive water or sugar water. It can cause dangerous hyponatremia. A moment of solid precautionary advice could avert a disaster in the making. The child's pediatrician will help more with this, and you can remind nursing mothers of the excellent La Leche League. It's an international group for breastfeeding support. They have local groups everywhere, including a hotline to call. Links are in the show notes. In our modern, fast-paced world, sometimes we just need some good old-fashioned human contact and support. For centuries, mothers would just put their jaundiced babies under gentle filtered sunlight to help resolve the jaundice. The blue light spectrum in the sun's rays actually changed the ring structure in unconjugated bilirubin to a more water-soluble isomer. It's amazing how a problem found in nature can be solved by another thing in nature. The bilirubin molecule has four pyrrole rings, from the Greek pyros, or fiery. The sleepy, poorly soluble ZZ isomer is illuminated to the more water-soluble EZ isomer. The sun activates the bilirubin rings of fire to wash out the urine and bile and fade the yellow fire from the baby. Pretty awesome, right? Nursery care. If the baby is at high intermediate or high risk for hyperbilirubinemia, then he's just going to need to be admitted for hydration. Often that's IV. Most babies with hyperbilirubinemia are dehydrated, which just exacerbates the problem. Billy lights or billy blankets provide the baby with the right blue spectrum of light to isomerize bilirubin to the more soluble form. Traditionally, we've thought them to be more effective or safer than filtered sunlight. But a recent randomized control trial by Slusher et al. in the New England Journal of Medicine compared filtered sunlight versus conventional phototherapy for safety and efficacy in a resource-poor environment. These were all term babies with clinically significant jaundice in Nigeria. To standardize the intervention, they used commercial phototherapy canopies that remove most UV rays. None of these babies became dehydrated and none of them got sunburned. The filtered sunlight resulted in a 93% successful treatment versus 90% for conventional phototherapy. My takeaway from the study is that we do have some evidence basis for using filtered sunlight as an adjunct for babies well enough to go home. Just counsel parents not to go overboard. Critical care. All right, that's all well and good for the stable patient for whom you have time to consider the risks and benefits of home versus nursery care for hyperbilirubinemia. Although this is rare, we need to be ready for the critically ill neonate with hyperbilirubinemia. He will be dehydrated, possibly in shock. He'll be irritable. Or he may just have a dangerously high bilirubin level. At any minute, he could develop bilirubin-induced neurologic dysfunction, or BIND, especially when bilirubin concentrations reach or surpass 25 milligrams per deciliter, or 428 micromoles per liter. The bilirubin is so concentrated that it leaches past the blood-brain barrier and causes neuronal apoptosis. BIND is a spectrum from acute bilirubin encephalopathy to kernicterus, all involving some disorder in vision, in hearing, and later on in gait, speech, and cognition. Acute bilirubin encephalopathy starts subtly. The neonate may be overly sleepy, or hypotonic, or have a high-pitched cry. If we don't pick up on this or check his total bilirubin, he can progress to irritability and inconsolability with a shrill cry. He may be later irritable or jittery or even lethargic. 
the dehydration and neurologic dysfunction from the hyperbilirubinemia may even cause fever. Check bilirubin in any neonate you're working up for sepsis. Taking acute bilirubin encephalopathy further, the baby may rapidly develop an abnormal neuro exam. He may show seizures or apnea or a coma. Kernicterus is the final permanent result of bilirubin encephalopathy. The child may develop choreoathetoid cerebral palsy with chorea, tremor, bilismus, and dystonia. He may have sensory neural hearing loss or cognitive dysfunction. It is for this reason that any newborn sick enough to be admitted should be considered for exchange transfusion. Most babies just need a little gentle rehydration and billy lights. But to be sure, the admitting team will look at a separate nomogram to gauge the child's risk and decide whether to pull the trigger on exchange transfusion. For our purposes, a ballpark estimate is that if the total serum bilirubin is 5 mg per deciliter above the phototherapy threshold, or if they have any red flag signs or symptoms, then exchange transfusion should be started. Well, what is it? Basically, it's taking small aliquots of blood from the baby and replacing them with donor blood. It's often a manual procedure done with careful monitoring. It can be done with any combination of umbilical arteries or veins with peripheral arteries or veins. In general, arteries are the output, veins are for transfusion. The baby may need a double volume exchange, which ends up replacing about 85% of circulating blood, or a single volume exchange, which replaces about 60% of blood, or any fraction of what could be a partial volume exchange. It's a very delicate procedure that requires multiple hours and often multiple staff. For our purposes, just be aware that the jaundiced baby in front of you may need escalation of his care. Let's get back to David. He was neurologically devastated, and it all seemed preventable. What can we learn from this case? First, the transition from increasing hyperbilirubinemia to acute bilirubin encephalopathy is rapid and unpredictable. This is why we go through all the trouble of assessing risk for severe hyperbilirubinemia and neurotoxicity, and we follow through with the right intervention, the right disposition, and the right follow-up. A serum bilirubin of 25 milligrams per deciliter or higher that's also 428 micromoles per liter, is an emergency. And finally, look for any early subtle findings of acute bilirubin toxicity. Irritability, drowsiness, hypotonia. Conversely, the febrile neonate may not actually be septic. He may be encephalopathic from hyperbilirubinemia. Do your normal septic workup and treatment, but get that total serum bilirubin to keep the child safe. Neonatal hyperbilirubinemia is the perfect opportunity to practice our closed-loop approach to precautionary advice, to patient and family understanding, and to good follow-up. This isn't a suture removal that has a wide margin of acceptable follow-up. Neonatal jaundice needs an airtight plan and a backup plan. Try to prevent the healthcare-seeking odyssey that David's family embarked on. Thank you for listening. Until next time, remember, you are the champion for the child in front of you. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Playbook. We welcome your comments, questions, and feedback. Email Tim at coach at PEMplaybook.org or drop by our website for show notes and more strategy at PEMplaybook.org. See you there.